this, please. Okay, so you've all got to sound intelligent now. <laughs> I'm sure. That's a tough bit. <laughs> Press the mute. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. You get shot now. Let me see how many pictures I'm showing you. Okay, so oh, I, it looks now as if can you not see anything except the screen? Uh, it hasn't changed. You can just see everybody else. We're just the same same view that we've seen already. We can't see anything yeah, different. I don't think you're sharing yet, Chris. Well, it says I am. Let me uh, let me do that again. Share screen. You know, I've done this before. You need to click it. So there's another box you click on. Right? How's that? Oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. Gosh, you think, That's it. Wouldn't oh, you think God. after the hundreds of zooms by now you get to know it? Okay. We've got some cool. <laughs> Congratulations. <Thanks. laughs> so that's, oh. the, that's a family tree. Oh, you mentioned this today. So hopefully, I don't know how many of you have seen that, but I thought that the reason why I love doing these things is because I think it is really, really important that oh. uh, the stuff the soldiers we've had in our in our families that uh, you know, we really know what they did and what they were about. So I just thought this was, I thought it also helped the introduction mm -hmm. today. You should be able to see yourself on there and you should see your link to the son or daughter of Sam and Edith. Nick, yeah. So I that that, that. The really great thing is I think most of the families that can be represented are, um, you know, I think that's, uh, that's just stunning really. So. Oh, so that's my nice little introduction and I, I decided I'd put in Angela thank you so much for this picture you sent me can you spot your relative oh, yeah. oh. Are you and the grandma yeah are you the no. one and I was I was looking at this and the dates that they were born <laughs> and I normally say in these stories well, you can be glad that your relatives survived the war because you wouldn't be here without it. But actually, half of you would have because half of you come from a line that were born pre-war and half of you come from oh, yeah. post-war. Yes. So yes. I, I can't yes. deliver that line. <laughs> right, so that's our that's our lovely family link to Sam. Uh, and we'll now do historic. I'm, oh, there's Sam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And is 13th Battalion, Kings Liverpool, and that's the story we're now going to tell. Right, I did say I'm not going to go over the ground that we did last time, and I'm not. Um, but this map sort of tells the story that we gave, and we just didn't really know how it ended. So, uh, Andy, apologies again. Google Maps won't let me do what the soldiers really did. Um, but if you take the top right there, is, is, are, uh, are the Belgium um, sites, the big... Sanctuary Ward, Vormazila, Kemmel. Uh, they were the trenches that he was in in the, in the first part of his war. In fact, most of his year in the war, the end of 1915 and then into 1916, was around the Ypres area. So we will be talking about the Somme, but the reality is he was most of his time up in Belgium and Ypres, as I think if you've seen the film, it was horrendous. That was where he was gassed. Uh, nothing pleasant about anything around Ypres. Um, but because of the impetus to get the Germans away from Verdun, where they were bleeding the French dry, uh, the Somme project came about to divert the German troops. So what you can see on this map is, uh, say in a roundabout way, uh, how he and the 13th Battalion moved out of Belgium to that little place. I'd, again, apologies, my pronunciation would be useless. Audric is that the railway station that the troops got on to head down south. Uh, and he was at Doulons there on the 1st of July 1916. Now, I'm sure most of you know 1st of July 1916 is the worst day in British military history. Um, there were 19,000 killed and 53,000 casualties. Sam was at Doulons station on the 1st of July. So he was heading for the fighting on the Somme, but it would be a couple of weeks before he got there. So I'm actually quite glad he wasn't there on that first day because uh, that must have been a nightmare. So the story we told ended at Basinton Le Grand and Delville Wood, but we couldn't make our minds up which, which one. 
So what this map shows is those two places. So Devil's Wood, oh, hang on, I'll move my cursor. So you can see Devil's Wood up here. Uh, and that's the where horrendous fighting took place here. The South Africans have this as their national memorial to the First World War, because they were basically trapped in the wood when it was devastated. Um, so like we talk about the Somme and Ypres, they talk about Delville Wood. Um, the, the red lines here are the trench lines on Ju in July 1916. So that's for people, I'll keep saying people who want to make the journey, because I'm sure some of you will, uh, you will be able to trace exactly where he was. And I've got even better stuff to come later. Um, but the debate we had, the red line is where the 13th Battalion of the Liverpools were. And we didn't know he was, there was a, a major attack on the night of the 13th going into the 14th here. And then on the 23rd going into the 24th here. And we didn't know which. And I think we felt when we first did this, he was probably at Delville Wood because that's the horror. You know, so many, we knew so many were killed or it's likely to be there rather than here. I can say at the introduction to this now, absolutely 99.99% .99 certain it's Basingtown. Oh, he is. He, I don't think he made Delville. I mean, it's a, this is only two miles from here yeah. to Delville Wood. It's part of the same battle, you could say. But uh, you'll see when I put my evidence forward, I am pretty certain it's here. And I think it happens on the 14th of July. I, I, I'm never one to say 100%, but I think I am as close as 99.9%. .9%. So that's the, uh, that was the initial thoughts we had. I, I, I got, when I did this, um, Harry and I looked at this and we thought, this is a page from the war diary. They're like gold dust of the 13th Kings Liverpool. And that's why I could pull the story together because you can go through in each, in the detail that the diaries are written up. You can see there on a day by day basis. So the story, I'd done all this trail up to here and you can see my horrible red lines there. Can, you can just see at the bottom, hopefully, can you, I can make the screen bigger if that helps you. Can you see at the bottom there, it says 14th of July in captured trench. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we know from this on the 13th of July at 10 o'clock, which uh, is what the history book said, left trenches to take part in the attack on the German front line at Basenton, the Grand attacked at 3.30 in the morning and took German trench and Basenton the Grand. Now that is quite a simple line. So we kind of had that and we know for three days after that, they're holding that trench. Mm. That in itself, I, what I couldn't get my head around is nothing followed that. Whereas the war diaries always give you the casualties. Uh, they'll give you pages of what happened in the attack. There's nothing on here. And I just had to leave. Hence, we were playing a guessing game of is it Basington or Delver Wood? So I, I left it at that thinking, well, we're never going to know. So what I decided to do was any of you who've been on the Commonwealth War Graves site uh, is if you're looking for a soldier that's died in the war, it's a fantastic site. They have everything listed there, where the cemetery is. Uh, what the grave references of your relative who's died mm -hmm. and normally when you go in you're searching a person and I thought I'll just test if you can put in rather than putting a person I just put Kings Liverpool 13th and I put the dates in that Sam was overseas uh, and they let you download it onto a spreadsheet which you can see here so I got this amazing spreadsheet that had every soldier who was killed while Sam was over there. Hence on the film, the second film I did, I thought it'd be a tribute to Sam to name them. So all those names appear on the film. But what this told me, as you can see from here, these are the soldiers on that 14th of July at Basington that were killed on that day. Now, this is only one page. There's a second page and there's a third page. Oh, and wow. it's an absolutely terrifying number. We'll, we'll cover this in a minute. Uh, it's just actually I could get very I will get angry about this story uh, as to, to how this has been reported and reflected because there's a story that should be published and isn't here there's no doubt about it but but moving on this what this told me when I then looked on the 23rd into the 24th of July it's hardly any so just I think I ended up the film the second film saying it is likely to be Basington. Just the sheer weight of numbers says, I think there were, made a note somewhere, 134 were killed on the 14th of July from Sam's battalion. Now, I always say, people say, well, how many casualties? You know how many were killed? 
I always think it's not a bad thing if you double that number. It gives you an idea of those who were wounded, of which Sam was one. So if that was right, that would say 134 killed, 270, let's say, wounded. You're talking about 400 out of a battalion of maybe 800-ish, just to throw numbers. What we're saying here is half, likely, half the battalion were, were casualties. So Sam, we know, was one but it looks like he was one of half the battalion. Now, that normally would make a major story of any history book around the period. I think it's a reflection that it's the Somme. It was such an horrendous few months around the Somme that there were probably hundreds of incidents like Sam's, I hate to say, where there's such a loss of life. So I think that's perhaps why this doesn't get the, um, the recognition of the I think it should. One other thing this told me, which uh, is incredibly upsetting, I hate to say it. Can you see on that spreadsheet, on the right-hand side, all these soldiers who died, that there's no grave. You see Tietful on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. Tietful is yeah. a monument on the Somme in France about four miles from Basentown, actually. Uh, so it's right at the heart of the fighting on the Somme. There were, tragically, there were 72,000 soldiers whose bodies were never found. Uh, and that will be for a variety of reasons. That will be, they were in the horror of the fighting. They just, their bodies, there's no nice way to say this, they just rot in the no man's land or the trenches. They're left there for weeks and months. They can't get to them. So there's nothing, there's no, no trait trace of them afterwards and also uh which is more pertinent to this story as you'll see later these places are blasted they're shelled millions of shells land so anybody who's killed uh the bodies are just destroyed uh and in fact some yes. them sorry was somebody going to say something then no you said obliterated yeah absolutely uh, and they'll have been bombed frequently, so there will be just nothing left of them. So what we're saying here is, so before we even get into the detail I'm going to give you, we know that, that of the 134 who were killed, there are 116 that were never found. So we're basically saying the horror of Basentown for Sam and his regiment, his, sorry, his battalion, uh, was exactly that. So actually Sam must have been extraordinarily lucky to be one of those few wounded that actually got out. Uh, that uh, it must, must, uh, He must have had an, a nightmare because he'll have witnessed this. Uh, despite his horrible wounds, he will have seen this going on around him. It gets worse and I'll give you the story behind it. But so the, kind of that's where we are. You could leave it here and say, I think within that you've really got his story. Um, that picture there is just to show, uh, I'll make that bigger. Um, the, the single red line there, is above Longueval, that is Basentown. So that's where he fought, where he was wounded. The double red line you can see is Tietful, where all those soldiers are named. Uh, it's definitely a place worth visiting. Those <coughs> blue circles are the cemeteries that the men who were buried are at. So, because I, I thought it very strange when I first searched here, I searched on the Commonwealth War Grave site for Delville Wood, and I thought there's not one 13th Battalion King's Liverpool soldier buried at Delville Wood. That doesn't make any sense. I now know why, because they just didn't find them. They were just obliterated. And those that did, they got them behind the line and see all the way back towards Amion. So they'd been wounded and died. Um, these all did die within that 24 hours. So these aren't dying weeks later, but they are buried in different places. So again, I think if anyone ever goes over there, I always think it's really great to pay tribute to people who were probably friends or possibly friends of, of Sam. So that's where I got with it. This map I got from a book about Delville Wood, uh, which is we're into now the fighting. I'm going to I'm going to completely forget the 23rd and 24th of July because it, I, I do believe it has no place in Sam's story. So we're going to focus entirely now on Basentown and Legrand. Bit confusing here because there's a Basentown Wood, there's a Basentown and there's a Basentown Le Grand. And the one we're looking at is, it's kind of, we'll see it frequently, this here, this sort of triangle. Uh, when I looked on Google Maps, that triangle is still there. So the village of uh, Basentown Le Grand is definitely there. I doubt there's a single thing left 
from World War One's day, where it would have been obliterated, but uh, at least we know where that was. We'll cover that in a minute. So Sam was in the 3rd Division and the 9th Brigade. The, uh, the brigade would have about three battalions, one of which was Sam's Kings Liverpool. And I know that Sam is this arrow here coming into the west of the village. That is the German trench, the first of the German trenches. Um, in fact, I apologise. That's the first of the Germans' trenches. That's the second of the Germans' trenches. And we'll talk about that. It, that's really critical. Remember the second German trench because I, that's where Sam was uh, wounded, uh, undoubtedly. So that gives you a perspective what's going on. What I would say about this map is, again, to get uh, your Sam into perspective of the war, uh, this, was a, this is an area of as bad as it gets, even for the Somme. I don't know how many of you know your history, but Mametz Wood, it's German, this, Mametz Wood is where the Welsh honour their, commemorate their fallen in the First World War. And with the 100 year centenaries, we did something at the Somme. Uh, I, I attended the Passchendaele one through because of a relative, amazing occasions. The Welsh with Prince Charles did theirs here on the Metz Wood. They were, during the same time that Sam was fighting here, they finally took the wood, but the Welsh were absolutely massacred. So it's kind of a pivotal pl place in their history. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so that kind of gives you a bearing of high woods up here, Delver Wood to the right, Montauban. All these places, if you look in your, your World War I history books, have massive stories to tell, and Sam is right in the middle of that. So this was my inspired moment where I thought, um, I just can't believe that there was nothing in the war diary. I can't believe we're not getting what the plan was and what happened to them on that day. So I thought, you know what, I won't just look at the end of the diary for July that I showed you earlier. I'll keep going through page after page after page after page and see, you never know, it might turn up a little bit further on. And this came up and it said, for reports by the 13th Operational Command, 13th Kings Liverpool on the operations of the 13th and 14th of July, and forget the 23rd, 4th, see the war diary of headquarters, 9th Infantry Brigade for July, 1916. So that, was great because it kind of said right we, we will have this somewhere and I thought all this information is held at Q and you can get it online at the moment um, but I could not find it it's one of these really hard things to search if you don't search exactly as it's held on their record if you if they put nine not ninth and you type ninth it won't find it it doesn't look for something similar I couldn't find it so I have a site called the Great War Forum if you ever need, if you're ever desperate to find somebody else's story, that's an amazing site. I just put a question on saying, can anybody help? I can't find the war diary for the 9th Infantry Brigade. Five minutes later, two people replied and gave me a link to it. It's wonderful. It's been a godsend for me. So there it is. And what we're now going to do is we can actually tell Sam's real story because it's written in the war diary of the 9th Infantry Brigade. Uh, battalion headquarters so this moves us into something that you know we didn't think we could get before this is gold dust i, I will say in this that those of you who are really keen i think you're going to see ex i'm not I've, I've not got all the documents because there'd be too many but i'm sure some of you will say you would love to have them and be able to read them in time so happy at the end to see what you'd like and i can kind of pull a pack together uh, and give it to you and you'd want to read them in leisure right so here's the pack i love this i thought i'd put that up <laughs> They're the remnants of the map taken into battle. Um, wow. That's the top of it. Uh, there is the map as well, but I thought, how brilliant that somebody wanted to have the whole lot. So you do get the map as well, but you got the fragments. And this is all around Basinton yeah. Legrand. So this is kind of the plan of attack. Um, they, that was their little guiding notes at the National Archives to piece the pieces of the jigsaw together. There are more than 12, that's just one page. I thought I'd show you to how you get the full picture of it. And clearly it didn't travel well from the war, no surprise there, particularly when you hear what happens to them. Uh, and this is then, this is the gold dust. This is the page that, that suddenly said, operations on the Somme. You can see the 14th of July, uh, and the, the brigade was the headquarters, the 1st Northumberland Fusiliers, 13th Kings Liverpool, which I've underlined, and the 12th West Yorkshires. 
the two battalions who attacked were Sam's 30th Liverpool and the West Yorkshire. The Northumberland Fusiliers were in support, but actually played a massively important role uh, on the day. Uh, but that's what you're now going to see. And you can see below, um, this is what was contained in the war, in the war uh, diary file. Notes on the operation, the operational orders, instructions for operations, intelligence reports, plans of dispositions and maps. So at this point, this is all about what they were going to do. I'll tell you when it becomes what happened. This is the plan. So it's fantastic, this. I mean, you don't rarely get this. This is really Sam's, uh, you know, two days around this area in some detail. So it, it lots of maps. You can see here, this is them, uh, how they would prepare for battle. Can you see the 13 kings top right there? Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that would have been their sketch pad. You can see the, the trench lines there, the squiggly line, which is the, tr the first trench line. And they're all given, they were different. Well, I'll cover the colours. And they all knew where to stand because they break down. Um, there would be 800 men and they all would have to know exactly which bit of ground. Uh, it sounded on this particular attack that they, they met up on open ground in no man's land, which I would have thought very unusual. Uh, but it didn't cause them any harm. Okay. Apologies. There are some documents, but they are the way to tell the story. And, and these are the documents I'm saying. Anyone who's really keen, I can try and get them to you. So you can see this is the 9th of July. So this is uh, a five days before the attack, four or five days before the attack. Preliminary instructions. But it is pretty much what they were going to do. I love some of this language, though. You can see... Uh, it is not possible to present uh, at present to assign definite, definite objectives to the brigades. So there's a lot of it is in the air. They have a plan. Um, you can see here, I think you'll get a mention. Uh, yeah, as far as can be foreseen, each battalion will have a front of attack of about 400 yards. And the objective is the second line of enemy's trenches. I did say keep remembering that. The second line of the enemy's trenches becomes critical in Sam's story. And the northern edge of the village of Basinton the Grand. So here's, it's just a, I think it's a great thing to have all these documents tell what he was, his day was about. Same thing here. This is the preliminary instruction for the attack. You can see the date there, 9th of July. And you can see, I've just underlined the critical things to capture and fortify the village of Basentown Le Grand. Uh, the capture of the village being carried out by the 13th Kings Liverpool and the Northumberland Royal Fusers were in reserve. So the Yorkshires are, are fighting there as well. I thought this was interesting that four machine guns would be attached to the 13th Kings Liverpools. The uh, battalions didn't have their own machine guns. I have a personal story of this for a, a relative of mine who was in the machine gun corps. They became independent early on in the war, which caused great uh, anguish amongst some very old established regiments who felt they should own the machine gun corps, but they didn't. There was a unique regiment. So these were handed out to battalions to fight, but they were critical. Machine guns were as significant as anything during First World War. So Sam had, it doesn't sound a lot to me that, four machine guns in a group of 800 plus people. I don't think, you know, that doesn't sound... Uh, uh, and one for every 200 men. Yeah, it's not a lot, is it? No, it's nothing. Yeah. Uh, okay, a little bit more on this. Again, it's just interesting background, this. Uh, time for preparation is very short. This is a chilling statement. This is a few days before the pre preparing for the attack. It is essential that all ranks fully realise that their tasks of carrying or working at, at must be carried through at all costs with even more determination than they would display in the assault. So the kind of saying here, the prelim bit, you do as if you're fighting really. And, you know, we, we see these stories, but here's, here's Sam actually experiencing it at the bottom. Uh, working parties um, for improving existing trenches and forward posts, especially the traversing of Mount Saban Alley. This is before the attack. Um, between 10.30 and 2 a.m. when the artillery will not be uh, on the enemy wire, wire-cutting parties are to be sent out to cut gaps in the enemy wire on the front allotted for battalion to attack. So days before the attack, some poor souls will have had to quietly creep through the night and try and cut the wire to make holes for the battalion to go through. 
Um, I mean, that, I think he had a 50-50 chance of coming back from that. Uh, yeah. And all this is, who knows? Sam's doing some of this, but who knows what? Uh, final bit on the problem, I think. I, I, I smile at some of the trivia around some of this, and you realise how um, almost charming some of it was. They wore each company within the battalion. They had to wear a little, it says here, coloured material will be drawn from the great brigade headquarters uh, as armlets fastened under the straps of the shoulders of each man in the company. So blue, green, red, yellow. And you were told where to go based on your colour. And I guess during the heat of battle, you kind of know who you were with by that. But they're just little, you know, they're just tiny little things on it. And I would imagine all the muck and the rest of it. Uh, I think that would the, dyna oops, the dynamic of that would soon change. Um, the each squad of grenadiers were provided with two yellow flags to show position reached by a squad. I smile at the, how we communicate now, and they've got little yellow flags to uh, to communicate. And equally at the bottom, as many men as possible will be prevailed with, uh, with mirrors for flashing to airplanes. A vigilant periscope is the make of, of the periscope. And I do know, reading around this area, we had, well, you'll see this in a minute, it's an amazing thing I'll show you. We had complete dominance of the air here for Sam. There was not one single German plane around that area uh, throughout this period. So we, we did have the, um, the skies, which was important for reconnaissance, as you will see in a bit. Um, this is the most chilling line of all, which you'll realize, let me just move, I can't read this because your faces are covering it. Uh, no. Um, it says, I say this is really critical to when you'll see what, what happens here. Uh, the assault will be, will be preceded by an artillery bombardment of the enemy's front line, of which the last period will be intense. You'll need to remember this bit. Under cover of this bombardment, the assaulting troops will step forward the within charging distance of the enemy's defences. At the hour fixed for the assault, the artillery will lift to the second line, I'm saying that again, of German trenches, and at a fixed time, will lift beyond the German second line. Exact artillery programme will be issued and it must be strictly worked on. And this was around the time of, you've heard of creeping barrage, where it would go in front of men when they're marching. But what they decided here was, that they knew the second line of German trench would be, once they take the first trench, they would be in the strong, the second line, Germany, the Germans always had stronger support trenches than the front line trench. So you might get through the first one, but the second could even be concrete. They were really desperately difficult to conquer. So they'd obviously decided the way to, is to blast them, is to have an hour's artillery absolutely destroying anything in that second trench. This is the plan of attack, I should stress again. Okay, and more wonderful maps here. You can see that little triangle I talked about. So there's Basentown. There's a, there was a keep. I had a look on Google Maps. I don't think there's anything here now, I'm afraid. And I suspect that very old keep would have been completely destroyed. Um, but this was how it would have looked afterwards, that the, the Germans would have been out, kicked out. These are machine gun points. So these are protecting the village barbed wire around it uh, and I think pretty much they got to that because they did take Basentown. It, uh, the, the 14th of July did end up with Basentown being taken so for all the horror that I described earlier they did they did achieve their objective I put that in inverted commas this is the most amazing thing I think I've ever found when I've done these sort of stories this is an aerial photograph taken a few days before for the lie of the land of Basentown so they were critical to seeing whether what the, you can see the trenches there's there's the triangle of bays and sunny can, can you all see that mm -hmm. uh, the keep is here you can just about make that out uh, and these are the two lines of trenches that's the first line and the second line here that they had to to go and we know sam's coming in this way he's coming to the west and was coming in down this line into the village so first stage here uh, and then wait for a couple of hours but artillery destroy this area and then they come through and take the village was the plan but i think that's an amazing record to have in the file and there's an even better photograph next that is a view now i'm really I've, I've spent a bit of time looking at that photograph wonderful picture you see the trenches really clearly and the woods 
Um, I'm trying to get, I'm sure if I, I look at a map a little bit better, I'll be able to pick out which wood is which, but I get the feeling that this is Mamet's wood and this is Delville wood, which would mean this is where Sam is here. This is Basinton here. I honestly can't say for definite, but I just tried to look at the shape of the woods. Delville wood, I think, is the biggest in the area, and that's clearly the biggest. Um, so it, and it, it would be on the German, these would be the German trenches he's photographing, obviously, not our own. So I think he's somewhere around here. But uh, I think if I spend a bit more time on that, I might be able to piece that one together. But a remarkable thing to have of Sam's story of his war, truly remarkable. Never, see, never seen anything like that before in all the time I've gone through these things. Uh, and this is a map showing the artillery barrage. So the different colours are different times. So you can see how they're bombing the first line of trench and through to the second. So these would have been for the gunners to know exactly. And it was very precision. It was, you know, they were remarca remarkably accurate. So they would have been as important as anything that was going on on this attack. So again, a wonderful treasure to have uh, of the whole experience. Uh, I, that's the uh, Carnoy is here. I think um, Basentown will be up here somewhere. Uh, I assume this is just giving the sightings of all the trenches around that area. Again, more intelligence for all the commanding officers. And again, another map. There's all of this is, is contained in the war diaries that were kept from the time. Okay, and here's so again the plan of attack, the task of the 13th Kings Liverpool to capture and consolidate the enemy's support line. Uh, these references you'd find on a map. Again, I think we could probably find that from the ones, certainly the one that was in bits, uh, to join up with the West Yorkshires who were on their left, to capture and clear the village of Basington Le Grand, to establish a defensive line from these two places, to construct strong points where trench. Uh, Meets track is that uh, to keep touch with and assist the attack of the seventh KSLI. So very clear what the thirteenth Kings wrote. They that their task was to take the village, to take the, to, to take the two trenches and take the village. Like I say, the village was taken. Um, not going to quote now, but this is again what amazing detail has been kept here. This was the assembly order. It's like being at school. This they were. This is when they were told what time you had to be here. So Sam was told 10 past 10 at the starting point. And you can see in these orders, yeah, you know, they, they are really clear. Oh. You know, they know what they're going into. Unfortunately, it doesn't end up that way. Okay, that, I don't know which battalion this is. All I know is it's the 13th of July at Basentown. So a wonderful picture. I've got some photographs here that are unbelievable. Part of this wonderful story is I have found, bumped into some things that I can't believe, photographs I've seen before. So lovely to have that and think, well, okay, we don't know it's the King Liverpool, but it's certainly in that area on that on that day at the time they were there. Um, okay, uh, we're now into, we're now into the horror, I'm afraid. It gets worse from here. We're now into, well, what did happen? So in the war diary, this is the bit I guess we want to know most of all. So apologies for this becoming having to read it but it's the only way you'll get to hear what happened uh, and I've kind of tried to underline the critical bits 13th Kings Liverpool on the right on crossing the rise in front of the enemy I think, I think of Sam here we're trying to get you know where might Sam have been in this and where might he have been wounded uh, on crossing the rise in front of the enemy wire came under heavy machine gun fire from the enemy trench and the village and some artillery fire but the wire having been well out the front trench, was quickly reached. There were but few of the enemy in it, and they offered no resistance. That's the first line of trench they've taken with no resistance. The advance was at once pushed onto the second line. Some of you might have recognised that's a mistake, that this was impossible to find owing to it having been obliterated by our artillery. Very heavy rifle and machine gun fire was met uh, with during this advance from the houses of the village, the road through the village and the communication trench joining the first and second German lines, which was the dividing line between the 13th Kings Liverpool and the 8th Infantry Brigade. So we know they've gone straight away to the, at this stage, they've gone straight to the second trench where they shouldn't have. Heavy casualties occurred, we know that, we've seen the, the list I showed you earlier. Heavy casualties occurred here on the east side of the road 
as many of the platoons as possible were drawn back into the captured enemy front line, but a considerable number of men pushed on right through the village, these unfortunately suffering heavily from our own artillery fire, which according to orders did not lift for one hour after zero hour. There, were no, there was no German, the Germans wouldn't put the artillery on their own trenches. I think we can say the shrapnel that Sam got was British fire. There's no question. The only artillery that's going on here, and we'll see a little bit more of it in a, in a minute, uh, it was for an hour. Now, when the artillery targets something like this for an hour, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of shells dropping. This is like, when you see the picture of that wood I showed you, um, there's nothing there. Well, that's what ends up. Everything's just devastated. And we saw in the report, they couldn't tell what the trench, if there was a trench there. So the men who've gone there, too quickly, well, sorry, the, most of this battalion has gone there too quickly, has had an hour with this sort of, a, so I think now we're beginning to see why is it they're all named at Tiepfel and they're not buried? Well, we can see why, because they'll have been absolutely blasted to bits. So uh, this is just an absolute nightmare, I really. I'm sure things like this happen constantly and the bombardment was so close to where troops were that that friendly fire must have been a regular thing. But on the scale of this is really quite shocking. The, the last comment here, just to, uh, to exemplify it again, the 13th Kings Liverpools have become much scattered and having lost heavily, especially in officers, the commanding officer who was himself wounded, asked for reinforce, reinforcements with which to capture the village. I say they did get that, but what we're getting from here, the first report is they went too quick, they didn't stay at the first trench and they ran into their own fire. And we know that artillery was for an hour. So no wonder a half of the battalion was, was wounded or killed. No, oh, sorry, I mentioned that. That's what we're saying about how they look. That is what Delville would like, would like, uh, would looked like in the middle of, 90, of July, 1916, that there is nothing left of these places. So it is impossible to see where you are. You wouldn't know where you were. Um, so, you know, you, you can see how the sort of devastation we described. Hard, it, I always think these images are hard to get your head around. And, if, and when you do go and visit them, it really is lovely to go and visit where your relative has been. But of course, you see lovely green fields and trees and it all looks rolling farmer's land. Well, because it wasn't when they were fighting there. This is, I'm now at the proof. This is the bit that tells me that I know Sam was wounded on the 14th of July. Uh, firstly, if you look at the stats, look at the Kings Liverpool, not officers, uh, eight killed, nine wounded, one missing, that there would have been about 30 officers in that attack. So we're saying 18 of the 30 were either killed or wounded or missing. And look at the stats for the other ranks, 117 killed, 243. Well, I said about doubling isn't a bad thing to do. Uh, to get that, It is about that in this case. 243 wounded, and is that a 61 or a 51? 60. 61, right, missing. So a total of 421. Now, I know from the Commonwealth War Grave records, there were 134 killed on that day. So what we're saying is, of, the, uh, of those missing, I'm saying 17 were killed, 17 of that that were missing and never found. So if you take those two together, you're talking about... Uh, 500 and something, 500 and a lot uh, of a battalion of maybe about 850. It's a, it's a, well, it's just a frightening number. And um, I would say it's as bad a story for a regiment as any. I am amazed this story isn't told more when you read books about World War One in general or the Somme in particular. Uh, the evidence for me that says I know Sam's um, wounded on this day is at the bottom. It says the brigade captured on this date about 70 prisoners. It is the now they the records for the on the war diaries always give casualties, always give prisoners that were taken, and always give um, weapons captured. Uh, without fail, you will get that in every war diary. So what I did, I went through in the brigade headquarters diary beyond the 24th of July. It's the only day that prisoners are taken is the 14th of July. Now we know. Angela, you shared the story with me that yes. he was. Does everybody know that story? I uh, think so. 
right? It, it's just that we know that Sam, when he was being taken away on a stretcher, when he was wounded, he was wounded with a shrap bad shrapnel injury in his thigh and fingers on both hands. Uh, and um, we, the story that uh, we know of him is that he was one of the corners of the stretcher was carried by a young German soldier who was a prisoner. So, and I think you said Sam used to tell that story, the poor boy being terrified of, in case he yeah, drops it. A, just a young lad and he did keep dropping him and right. they, they were they were hitting him and, you know, sort of, um, you know, beating him for dropping him. And then when they look, they realise that the German had had part of his hand blown away and that's why he couldn't carry the stretcher. Gosh, yeah. But uh, again, I think you can see why I'm saying the evidence is all building up here. This is the day that yeah. Sam's clearly this is the day yeah. that Sam's wounded. So we've got his story here. We, we have now got his story. This is really it in many ways. Uh, I did find, uh, remarkably, as I was looking for, the I've got a, an index of came from the Pensions Committee in 1920 something. I can't believe I got a copy of it, of all the casualty clearance stations in World War One. I. I wanted it because I wanted to find where my granddad was at in, when he was gas was his uh, scenario uh, and it doesn't give you much info it lists them you don't get really much more than that and I looked for well where's the one near Basentown and it was just south of Basentown between Basentown and Montauban this is a photograph on the 14th of July of the casualties wow. uh, south of Basentown so this will have been where Sam was taken when he was wounded uh, they had yeah. they had two stages. You were taken to the casualty clearance stations were basically just tents and temporary things that they threw up. They could be very big, but you were then taken to a stationary hospital somewhere behind the lines. And they were often just built. They were often, in my granddad's case, it was a girls' school that was converted to a hospital during the war. Uh, but there were kind of two stages and then ultimately back home to the UK, which we know happened to Sam. A second photograph, quarry siding, they call it. I have to say, it looks the most horrendous of places if you can just make out things. Mm -hmm. and it's just desolate. You you'd see the trees at the top here, what's left of them. There are some buildings around here. Um, oh, I just think all of it. There's, there's, there's no good experience around any of this, I'm afraid. And, and it must have been, even out of fighting, it must have been a nightmare to live through. Mm -hmm. uh, does anybody has anybody seen that photograph? No. Oh. Right. no. Can you can you all see me on your screen? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because uh, that photograph means a lot to me. Uh, I have, as you, you won't be surprised to hear, I have numerous books around the First World War that I've collected over the years, and I know that photograph really well. And I'll just give you an example of it on the front of this book. You'll see that's the same photograph. Yeah. So this yeah. book is. It was built up of lost voices. These are men who survived the war telling their stories around World War I. Um, did a few of these, but uh, so I'm used to that photograph. I could show you easily four or five different things that got that same photograph leading into them. And it, it's quite, you'll see it on the TV and a lot of documentaries because it's a German prisoner wounded uh, and British soldiers wounded coming back together. It's kind of a comradeship picture that. That mm -hmm. is taken on the 14th of July at Basington. Wow. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Uh, when I saw that, I thought, well, I know this. I know this picture. I kind of know the story, but never knew where. Gosh, it, it re will really resonate with me now. So uh, yeah. it will be the line that uh, Sam would have walked back, but it's brilliant to have that. And also, oh, yeah, I, got, I got another beauty. Basentown, the Grand, 14th of July, 70 prisoners. Gosh. Oh, I mean, what a treasure to have that. I've got to say, this is all yeah. the Imperial War Museum. They have some a lot of photographs they don't put online. I suspect there's some crackers you could get, but these they did. And uh, when I found it on the search, and I thought it won't be. And if it is, it won't be the day. It's Basin Telegraph, and it's the 14th of July. And I started trying to count them, and it's really hard <laughs> the back end of that queue. <laughs> but I think you do get. I, I got to kind of when I got to about here, I was at 40, and I thought that's not a bad. That looks right. That uh, so. Um, yeah, how yeah, remarkable. Again, I, I kind of need to finish the end of our film, don't I? I think I need to throw this all in now because we've, we haven't half got a story of what really happened to him. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, God, what nightmare this was. Uh, the uh, seat, was it Seaton, his name? The, the uh, report was written up by the mate, we'll see his name in a minute, uh, the major responsible for looking after the battalion. Now, these are the guys that are behind, they're not fighting. 
Uh, they're the ones that would have been hated. They, they, they threw men into these horrible scenarios. Uh, usually their reports typed up and it was typical. The West Yorkshire record was typed up. The Northumberland Fusiliers was typed up, but Sam's Liverpool's battalion was scribbled on six pages by uh, his major. So I thought it will tell what happened. So you'll be delighted to know I typed it up. Uh, oh, well done. <laughs> well done, Chris. <laughs> uh, you'll find on a couple of occasions, it's not that he's swearing. You'll see I put a couple of asterisks in. See one at the top there. And that's just, I have no idea what that word was. And I, I could be half an hour that I thought I'm giving in. Uh, none of it is critical. And you can actually guess something to come in there. But this is, we're at the end of his story really here. I have to say, I am incredibly uncomfortable with this. That is putting it really delicately. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely horrified at the report written by this major uh, who is clearly looking at it after himself, his own back. If you do, I've done the red bit because this is how he's described it. I'll take you, rather than reading it all, I'll take you from the bottom of this first paragraph. So I'm talking now, the second trench is the critical thing. We know they went to the second trench too early. And he says in his report, on the left of the road, the companies experienced little difficulty in taking the second line. But on the right of the road, the second line trench was so pounded by artillery fire that it was almost wiped away. And it was very difficult to something, see where it had actually been. It was therefore thought advisable to inform the battalion back in the first line trenches before making a further advance into the village. The commanding officer at this time had gone to the road on the left of the village. When we advanced, we found we were heavily exposed to machine gun fire possibly where Sam got his fingers exposed uh, from the main centre road and the house tops in the village. So it was decided to push our machine guns forward in order to assist the battalion in its forward advance into the village. This was successful and gave great assistance in the forward movement. Here our casualties amongst officers and men was very heavy as the enemy had many snipers and guns hidden. It was found very difficult to ascertain their whereabouts. We also had some difficulty in maintaining communication across the whole front occupied by the battalion. However, we succeeded in putting this right. So his story is uh, they were doing the right thing and they just got ambushed a bit by the machine guns. And the bit I hate is at the bottom in his remarks. I, bear in mind, we're talking about, what did I say? 530 men killed or wounded over half his, bata over half his battalion. And he writes... I consider that this attack was successful in many ways as something to the excellent and clear, no, due to the excellent and clear preparations by the staff beforehand, i.e. me. Uh, everything was ready at the appointed time and therefore, but I've the page and I've made splits when it's a new page. Uh, no unforeseen difficulties arose during the attack. No unforeseen difficulties arose during the attack. And it only showed how absolutely necessary it is for the sake of all concerned to make full preparations and prepare every detail so that all concerned are thoroughly acquainted with all they have to do before any operation in the field is undertaken, as on the clearness of orders and detail always depends the success or otherwise of the result. So Major Seaton, I, I hope I do forget your name, as clearly this is written as a, I got this right, you know, we, there were some things that happened, but no unforeseen difficulties. Gosh. We're talking about an hour of our own artillery taking out over 100, killing over 100 and worse. And the fact that we know that their bodies are not recovered, uh, this isn't a question of, well, we didn't take it and they're there in no man's land for a month. Well, we took the village. So wherever they were, well, within a f you know the same day or certainly the next day, you would have been able to recover them. So sadly, that trail of all those men who were named at Tietful is because all of those names will have been blasted for an hour by British artillery. So it is, a, I found this, I just found it really horrific, you know, really distasteful. You know. Um, yeah. And I recognise that thing went on. I guess it's just when you bump into it yourself and when it's your, your family, it's, it feels even more pertinent. Um, this, just for interest, I did look at the casualty figures for the 24th of July, where, and I thought perhaps there weren't quite so many because I, I saw there were only four other ranks killed. Um, and, but it's, a, it's quite a high casualty still 32 wounded, 14 missing, three officers wounded. Um, 
there were only 24 hours at Delville Wood because there were, it was in the diary it said they weren't needed at the line. They, they fit in for that first the first day of the attack, but there were enough troops around, so they were pulled back. And I know there's no other occasion where Sam could have been wounded because the battalion isn't in battle again until mid-August, and we know, you know, in, in August, with the papers are telling of his uh, wounding. So, so I, I think I'm sure you'd all agree with me. This feels like a I'm at a police station here. I'm giving evidence on that. Yeah. Um, I think we can all say, I think it is a 99.9% .9 certain that um, Sam is wounded at that second trench on the side of the village on the 14th of July. I think yeah. certainly that's where the shrapnel will have come from. Yeah, I um, think you've proved your case there, Chris. Thank you. And we take a vote at the end if you'd like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> casualties, I mean, look at this. How horrific is this? Casualties for the month. Most of this are those two days but there were a few others. Uh, after, on the 15th, 16th, 17th, there were a few Kings of a poor kill, but not many, a handful. But look at those stats, you know, um, 23 officers and, you know, three, four, five, it's just, it is, it's two, half to two thirds of the battalion within those two attacks. And sadly, the vast majority done by our own fire. Um, uh, very last, this is the very last thing now, um, you kind of know what we know, but there was just something else that gave a little bit more to it. Uh, this document, a few pages of this, is say is giving you a notes on the attack of the 14th of July, and this was written on the 26th of July, and it's not uh, Mr. S uh, Seaton, thank goodness, uh, it's back at Brigade Headquarters, and it's a much more rational, this is a lessons learned document, and actually I thought read really well, and if you were you, you would be reading this to say, what did we learn for when we next go into a similar sort of attack? And if I just point out two things on here, so number two, the use of Stokes mortars. That's what a Stokes mortar looks like. And it's not, I don't know where that is, but it's in a wood. So I think that's a, a perfect image. Uh, I'm really proud of that picture because my granddad was in the trench mortars. So he had that oh. job. Uh, and a tough job that was because they were very near the front as well. But the the aftermatch report, you might say, of what went on, uh, says very much that they drew, they were struggling to hold the village, as we saw earlier, and they brought these trench mortar guys in, and it completely changed it. They secured everything, thanks to these guys. Uh, but the bit that is most pertinent to our story is this, the artillery bit. King's, 13th King's Liverpool suffered considerable casualties from our own artillery in the village of Basentown, Le Grand, this was owing to it being impossible to recognize the second enemy trench line from which no advance was to be made for one hour. This, you know, this is horrible. The artillery lists were very carefully explained to all units, but the first objective being obliterated, 13 Kings Liverpool carried on in the excitement of the fight right through the village and beyond it. My dad talks of his second world war experience of exactly that, that he said, adrenaline makes everybody do in different things but that adrenaline they'll have taken that first trench so it was obvious they got that easily there were no casualties they took it within minutes probably they must have thought oh there's a rout here and the, the excitement of it all and the, and unfortunately because it did say i think i read earlier the communication lines went so the only people who knew those plans are the majors and the officers but if they can't talk to the troops they can't say well i don't go any further because we're about to blast it we're about to absolutely obliterate uh, the German stronghold around the side of the village. So you can see how easy communication gap could cause something like that. But I thought, I thought it interesting in the lessons learned, they particularly mention the, the excitement of the fight, you know, of, of what they'd done. Um, and then there's a lesson learned about, you know, future, how you, how you manage that. And thank you to, I think, Leslie, had that photo i got it via angela but uh there's there's your granddad great granddad great great granddad he's the middle one in fact there he is there he is <laughs> isn't that amazing you yeah. see his finger oh yeah well i can remember his fingers really pointing and um, one of his four fingers had from the first joint was missing and he'd point up and i'd wonder what this little stub was and right. part of that on his other hand, and there was at least one other finger. I can't remember which. Right. 
and I guess again trying to put the balance of what, what we just read was going on um, that there's, there's, there's a combination of an hour of shelling from ourselves and machine gun fire there wouldn't have been many troops the Germans uh, did this uh, during the war they, they had a different tactic of um, rather than filling their trenches uh, they would have strategic machine gun emplacements so probably that that's, that would be what Sam had to fight that he had to tackle the nightmare of the shelling which we know took his part of his thigh away and also I'm guessing his fingers then are bullets ricocheting everywhere he's he's got his hands you know in a place that uh, you know and he's probably ducked he will have spent quite well almost certainly he will have spent that entire hour because no one could be taken out of that he will have been one of those incredibly lucky 200 and odd who that just you know ducked and dived or found a bit of protection and okay he got one bit of shrapnel got him but I'm sure he will have looked back on that and thought massively he was a lucky one you know uh, how and that just how brilliant that he you know was able to come through I think it's just a great thing to finish this story off by seeing him in hospital and I'm guessing he's that man third from the right yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, I've not seen that before I think that's just brilliant. What I would really love to do, Angela and I said it the other day, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could find out where the hospital in London? London? Yeah, I'd love to know which one it was. Yeah, we'd have that. If the, unfortunately, there's no service record for Sam. The service records, I think we said this previously, uh, from World War One, were massively destroyed in the blitz of World War Two. And I think your odds are one in six surviving. And the ones I've found when I've researched, a lot of them are uh, damaged. So you can see bits of them. And occasionally you get, I did one recently for a relative of mine, a whole lots of 38 pages. It was a gem, an absolute gem. Uh, but so if we'd have had that, that would have had the details of the hospital. Mm -hmm. We'd have known where he ended up, but I'm not so sure there's any way we're going to find that. I've, tr I've tried because I'm a granddad being in hospital, I've tried to research yeah. that and get very little support from the military circles. Mm. Uh, right, I'm going to finish with a because I know some of you, and I'm really happy to, I, I go to France and Belgium, or used to go to France and Belgium, mm -hmm. a different world, uh, <laughs> probably about three times a year. Uh, there's a mate, there's a few mates, but one in particular where we do this, and I, I do stuff for local schools, the past pupils that were killed in the war, so we did some great experiences. I am really happy, and my mates said the same thing. We feel we know Sam because he's he's watched the films. Um, and once you've done this sort of research, you know, I'd love you to join you and, and visit these places. Uh, but just if you do want to go, and uh, what I would say is there's a kind of a double trip that you do in the same trip, which is would be really wonderful. Uh, the, the two halves, if I take the Somme first, there's Basentown Grand, which clearly, if you only did one place, you're going to want to go and see. Uh, and, and you would be able to get that little triangle will make it so easy to trail exactly where they were uh, and where they they attacked uh, the village so it's very easy for this but there are places then Arras up here is a wonderful place to stay just absolute gem of a place so your trip would be taking that there are a few things that everyone sees Loch Nager mine Harry that's what you sent me the picture of yesterday by fluke that's right yeah yeah, on the, uh, on, the, on the 1st of July, they had crater, they had uh, mines all around, uh, which were devastating as part of the start of the attack. Uh, quite a few of them remain, but most of them are just now pond flooded out. Loch Nager mine is owned by a Scottish chap and it's preserved and it's the most amazing site and it's enormous. It's terrifying when you realise the devastation that must have caused. That is about three miles from where Sam... Okay. Was wounded so you would definitely do you go and see that as part of his story the Tietfel memorial is this anyone who goes to see the Somme there's a, a, a visitor center there and obviously this is where most of the is the names of the 13th battalion Liverpool Kings Liverpool they're there you definitely want to take that in the Newfoundland uh, park is um, uh, is Canadian owned and they look at that it's the only preserved uh, part of the battlefield of the Somme that was just fenced off and protected. So it stayed as it was in 1916. So you aren't allowed anywhere near the, um, the air itself because it will still be full of shells, unexploded shells, you name it, mm -hmm. and it's consecrated ground. But they, it's all free and you get a tour guide comes to a Canadian youngster. It's great the way the youngsters manage it. 
takes you around and the trenches are still there, clearly grassed over, but you're still the sort of depth of them. And a, it's a remarkable experience to give you a feeling of what uh, the Somme's like. They lost 98% of their uh, battalion was affected. They weren't all killed, but the vast majority were. Theirs is a horrendous story. Uh, so there's your Arras story. And there's Arras. It's, I just couldn't reckon. I stayed up here, the place up here. There were six of us. We absolutely loved it. And it was a, not just because of the historical links. It's just a pretty place. You know, it's a, a great mm -hmm. trip to make. And the second trip would be Arras to Ypres. It isn't two hours, three minutes. Arras to Ypres is an hour and a quarter. Again, it's no distance. Uh, but I've written on here, you would want to see Vimy Ridge is a spectacular um, memorial, absolutely spectacular memorial that you'd be passing anyway. You would want to call in. And again, they have underground mines. They take you underground to show what was being tunneled there and the uh, preserved trenches there, wonderful place. And there's there are the trenches I'm saying Sam was at. I think if you've seen the film, Popper Inge is where the soldiers went to pretend life was normal. Uh, mm -hmm. It's an absolutely wonderful trip. You could not miss that. And I haven't put it on here, but Passchendaele is about here. You'll have heard of Passchendaele. Uh, Tynecott Cemetery is the largest cemetery, uh, Commonwealth War Graves Cemetery in the world. And it's about here, Tynecott. You have to go there. It's a chilling place. It tells the story around Passchendaele itself. Um, but it is, again, because you're in this area for Sam's story. And Ypres itself, again, it's just a wonderful place uh, with yeah. incredibly friendly people. You'll think you're in England because it's just full of um, English tourists trying to retrace family stories and, and the Belgians love us for it. They do an eight, you'll have, I'm sure most of you will know about the last post at eight o'clock at night uh, every day. <clears throat> and they, at 10 past eight when it's all over, if you get to the pub on the corner quickly, they serve Brits at half price. <laughs> there you go so it's worth the trip <laughs> but it is a mad it's just a beautiful place to visit there you go and that's my last there there's Sam absolutely Sam. brilliant Chris Let me yeah fantastic Let me yeah start. absolutely brilliant yeah yeah, yeah thanks ever so much Good yeah. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. It's a rem isn't it a remarkable story I thought yeah, it, yeah. Uh, you yeah, know incredible. You may never have found that. It could have been, in a way, it was enough to say, well, we know he was in that area and we know his journeys. He kind of had his story from what we'd done before. But once I found this in the, in the war diary, because of the nature of the information in it, it has completely told his story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's no gap now. You know. Fantastic. But it's not a good story, is it? <laughs> not really, no. But, you know, there's, 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 I was just thinking there's a few people here who are glad he survived. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I thought you were going to fade us out for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> it's the thought for me of um, he will have been an hour with all that shelling going on. And, 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 they, are, and they say they, they obliterate the area. So if you come out of that, yeah, you must be unbelievably lucky. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay he got badly wounded in it but uh, you know mm -hmm. he, he survived it remarkably mm -hmm. but who knows how long he would have been uh, in yeah, well, uh, yeah. oh. uh, we're just working out who would have been here if he hadn't survived <laughs> that's what I was doing <laughs> yeah my mum would have been the youngest yeah, yeah. Yeah. hands up yeah, yeah. yeah. Hands yeah. Up. yeah. 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 Yeah, well, my dad was the one born when he came back. Yeah, I was just going to say uh, for Lynn and Samantha, yeah. uh, Sam was born. As soon as he got back. Yeah. <laughs> he must have visited him in hospital. Uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, in fact, he had two. He had Ellen in 1915 yeah. and he had yeah. Sam in 1917. When, when Grandad went to war, my mum, um, my grandma, was pregnant with my mother and neither of them knew. So on that photograph of Grandad before he went, right. there was a corresponding one as grandma who was pregnant and didn't know. Oh, wow. And when he was in the hospital, yeah. my grandma went to visit him and taking my mum, who was the baby that had just been born. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh wow. My mum was born in May 1915, so. Right. Yeah, yeah. before. Mm. So all, all of those are born to anyone 
him within my mum would not be here. Yeah. 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 Oh. It's an amazing story. It's an amazing family story. Yeah. And well, it's I'm... all down to you, Chris. No, it's all down to well, Seth. Actually, it's down to Angela as well. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah. no, because I, no, I, just, I just started it off, but Harry picked Harry picked it up and gave it to Chris. So it's I, I wouldn't couldn't have taken it any further than the little bit I did. Yeah, to you me, did a lot, it, though, Ange. I always feel when it's finished that wouldn't it have been terrible for the family? You know, it could have been buried forever that story, and most are. I mean, yeah. you think. They, yeah. des they deserve so much more than that. They, you know, to go through mm -hmm. that, you did mm -hmm. have a bit of information about Sam. Often, they, people know nothing, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Don't know where they were, what they went through. So you had a little, you had a taste certainly of his wounds. But mm -hmm. I think when you go through something like that, um, you know, they've done all that and they've done that for yeah. us. You know, we are fortunate that we've had the freedom uh, mm -hmm. since you know both the, those world wars. So we owe them so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I think on the back of that, I just think. I think it's really important their if you can get their stories. If it's if it's hidden, fair enough. But if it's there and it's just a question of it gathering dust, and it just needs <laughs> how to turn the page over, um, I think that's what makes this so special. You know, because I know the great thing now is um, this. Why I like the kids being involved on any of these discussions that these stories should just keep getting passed down now. Yeah. You know that yeah. they should never be forgotten. Mm. You know, they should never go. Uh, Did he ever talk to anybody about it? Any memories that he had, or was he one of the guys that said nothing really as he got older? Because I did. My dad never mentioned stories from his war experiences or anything. I think he must have um, done a bit because it was my dad that told me about the story about the German prisoner. So he'd obviously oh, yeah. heard that, but he. I don't think my dad knew that much because I don't think he talked that much about you know all the bad stuff. Yeah, um, but I don't know. I guess, yeah. I, I think my... my cousin Joe about it because Joe told me what he Joe told me about the story about the fingers and how um, how my granddad lost his fingers. So my cousin Joe, being the eldest of all the cousins, um, mm -hmm. I think maybe yeah. granddad spoke to him a little bit about it. Okay. But uh, he, my mother said he would never speak to the family. Okay. I so think that's common. That... I think that's yeah. 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 I think that's or maybe it was just the women in the family he didn't speak to. Yeah, my mum didn't seem to know a lot about him at all. No. Yeah. Really. yeah. I went thinking now, knowing the story we know, I, I'm not sure I'd want to tell anyone all that. No. no, no, no. Um, Wasn't the done thing though that he didn't talk about those things? Did he? You kept it all in It's inside. typical of old soldiers, yeah. isn't it? That they don't yeah. talk. It's a it shame, is. really. Was, yeah. there a bit of a, was there a bit of a stigma around the friendly fire as well? Yeah. I, I wondered that because mm -hmm. he would have known, you know, it would have been blooming obvious that the firing was coming from behind them. So, yeah, you might be right, Andy. That would have been, you know, what a thing to admit you've been wounded anyway. Uh, maybe he's felt a bit like a hero coming home <laughs> for a very short period. But then, yeah, if that had been open knowledge that actually it was our yeah. own troops that, oh, that, that would be a horrendous yeah. thing for anyone to get their head around. Because um, it kind of all feels avoidable, but I, I can't think of anything worse than, you know, the, the mistake that that was. Uh, mm. You know, I, mm. I thought that interesting reading the report of where it went wrong, because, you know, whatever you say about it all, uh, the fact that the men got overexcited, who was stopping that? Who was managing, you know, that somewhere that line of command, uh, you know, has failed horrendously. Mm. The comms may have been very poor, may have been cut. But those officers who would, would be part of that uh, obviously watched that happen and uh, just maybe, yeah. they, maybe they couldn't do anything, but you know, it asks a lot of questions. Um, you would get... Hillary. Some... Sorry, Harry. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. Hillary, has your dad got some tales? Because he had some uh, narrow escapes, didn't he, in the desert? In the Second World War, yeah. He was a desert rat, my dad, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the Eighth Army. So... Oh. Yeah. He lost a lung though, didn't he, just after the war? Yeah, got a big lung. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he got, yeah, yeah. He was injured in the war. He was also injured, wasn't he, in a tank? Yeah, he was, um, <laughs> I think he was blown off his motorbike or something. Um, and he ended up in South Africa. <laughs> but he only ever talked about 
the lack of water, you know, like obviously we couldn't leave a tap dripping because he'd say, I only had a cup of water to wash and myself and drink all day long. So if you left a tap on, obviously with the living in the <laughs> desert for so long, but he never really spoke about it, no. He told me dad a story about um, the Gurkhas that he was with. Yeah, yeah. Something about ears. <laughs> 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 And you said, I mean, it's the Second World War, yeah. I mean, mm. you know, who knows? If never mm. really researched it or anything. Well, there you go. I've set the ball rolling now. You now need to cover all your family's wars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got a template. We need to all get, to get, get together. <laughs> we, should, we should get a mini bus. We should all go over there, shouldn't we? We'll go off on a family holiday in a minibus somewhere. Do you know what? <laughs> I, I would really advise that because the, the trip, if you've never done it, it, even if you just go, it's not following your own relative, they are, it sounds strange to say beautiful places, but they honestly are. Even the cemeteries and they're so beautifully looked after. Uh, it's like walking into a, a lovely English rose garden or a, that they're incredible places. And the towns and the villages are, are, are really interesting as well. But mm. to actually do it, which is what my mates say, to follow in the footsteps of someone is the way to do it. You know, to do it something that, you, you could yeah. go and just visit the visitor centre at the Somme, but to go to Basentown and walk, the walk, because you, you'll be able to stand where the map was, you'll be able to walk where he marched, they'd be through a field, and there might be some places you think, well, actually, no, they probably don't want me to walk through it. I, occasionally I've done that, but they do say, there's just too many shells still, there's millions of shells uh, oh. that you, you know, are still being found. Uh, so you need to be careful with that. But I think here, mm -hmm. I think the road line would still be very visible. The village might look, a lot different than it did over 100 years ago but you do mm. get that I, I do it with my granddads and it's a remarkable sensation you get of knowing you're walking over the trench you, you would be able to walk over that second trench the one we're saying that mm. caused all the havoc we know exactly where that mm. is on the map you would get that very easily and trust me standing there knowing what you know now mm. yeah I, I can't describe the emotions that gives you it's like nothing you'll have ever experienced mm. you know and it does really finish it off it does give you a closeness to your relative story I, I did my dad was only a POW in Germany for about god two weeks uh right at the end of the war uh and I got to the site where that camp was and we stood there for I would say a couple of hours and we'd planned I'd planned the day meticulously totally mm. messed up the timings because I mm. thought well it'd be half an hour you know there's nothing yeah. to see there probably mm -hmm. we couldn't move we couldn't leave it you know, it was, uh, you'll feel the same. You'll not want to move away from it. So, uh, and that, that's the film you can do. Cause I think to film a following in the footsteps is a great thing to do, you know, to alongside the stories we've got to film Basington now, to film Sanctuary Wood, all the trenches, Vermazila, all the places oh. that we know he was at, uh, you, you, you know, and you can do his trip is an easy one to follow in his footsteps. There's not an awful lot of distance involved. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, def I would massively encourage it. I think um, Arras was not too far away, was it? Arras is only yeah. half an hour north of, of Basin. Yeah, because that, that's where um, my grandmother's brother was killed, which is Albert. Sam's brother-in-law. Okay. He was Albert, he was killed in Arras, and he's buried there in a Commonwealth grave at Arras. Right. Uh, I know it was 1916, but I don't know if it was before Sam was injured or, or afterwards. Right, the fighting at Arras was around 1915, the worst of it, but it went on then as well. Mm -hmm. But they they always say that's the hidden story that we talk about the Somme, we talk about Ypres, but I think the number of casualties at Arras was worse than any other fighting. Oh, but, but no one talks of it. It's kind of yeah. the, the forgotten yes. battle, you might say, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, oh, no, Arras is uh, an easy place to find places because it's big yeah. enough. Uh, it's a, it's a, a place of numerous squares. You know, you think you get lost because you think, oh, we're back at the square. And you think, oh, I don't think it's the same square. Um, no. So, it, but they're all pretty. So, you know, you can spend all your evenings. It's great doing all this, but obviously it's great to have a chill out in the evening, nice food and drink. And Aris and Ypres are perfect for that. You know, they are just uh, wonderful. And they'll be glad to have you after, after COVID. You know, they must have missed out on a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, that's gone. so listen, the only thing I was going to say then is I did mention, I don't know how many of you want those documents. 
Yes, please. Yeah. Please. Yes, please. Yeah. Great. Right. Right. Well, you can send it to me if you like, Chris. And I'll going to do it. that. Have you yeah. got email addresses? Yes. I will. I'll. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll rely on Angela. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I send, if I do, I can send uh, Harry, uh, Andy, Cass, and Angela. I've got your emails, so I could do four of yeah. you. And if yeah. you can then make sure the others get. I mean, I mm -hmm. could just throw the entire war diary, but you're talking about um, the two together is about 300 pages, and oh. it's a pain finding your way into it. So I think it's probably better yeah. if I cut. Probably them. wouldn't send anyway. Be Sorry. Too many. It probably wouldn't send anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, I've thought of that. Yeah. No. Yeah, you picked out all the relevant, all the most important well, bits with yeah. what you gave us, didn't you? So. And actually, there isn't much more. I showed you some pages. It's not like there were 30 yeah. pages at the same time. You know, there were probably three or four pages that, you know, you didn't see. Uh, but I think reading it, what it does do, I'm definitely thinking of Emily's schoolwork. Gosh, what a story you can paint. Yeah. Wow. You yeah. Know? Because you, you get that the, the detail of the order of battle is remarkable. Not just yeah. for what were they trying to take, just what the men had to go through, and all the saying, even that the little yeah. yellow flags dropped down as markers, um, how yeah. they had to what they had to pick up at the at the dumps. They had dumps about a mile away where they would kit themselves out. Uh, it's all there in incredible detail. So yeah. you kind of feel if ever you wanted an experience of what it was like being a soldier in the First World War. You read those the preparation for the battle and that's what it's like that's what they're actually doing and going through even the trivia you know so they are wonderful things to read you don't and you don't always get them you know these are in, in that diary those aerial photographs i've never seen that before and, and i've seen a few war diaries but what an incredible legacy mm -hmm. of sam's to know you know obviously massive uh, incredible part of uh, preparing for the battle was knowing that they could get up in the air and unchallenged they had <laughs> the German locations of strength absolutely to a T they'll have known right up to the the day they they, they went over there you know they went over the top they'll, they'll have had all the reconnaissance so they had so much information you know I, I say just you look at all that and all that planning and all the advantages they have and it still went wrong yeah yeah you know uh, mm -hmm. I think communications is a is a awesome. massive thing in the first world war they, they struggled, I think it wasn't great always in the Second World War, um, but it was, particularly in the First World War, it didn't take much. You see, you know, pictures of them, don't you, of these men with the wire running in the middle of battle, trying to run wire across the area and head back. Most of them were killed in trying to do that because they were targeted. Snipers knew they were critical if you get the comms people out. So <clears throat> you are then completely blind. And I think we said it when it was in the Ypres area, in the Sanctuary Wood area. I think I showed a picture of it from the time on, on the film, it's like the moon. Well, you know, you imagine that landscape and the woods would be the same if you did get a little bit out of sync. You wouldn't know what you were doing, where you were, which way to go. It must have just been chaos. And in the middle of it all, thousands and thousands of shells are going on, right? You know, you're not just, yeah. look, as, as we do, looking around you. Um, they're terrified there. Yeah. So you would, yeah. I don't know, I think you just run in panic in any direction. Yeah, yeah. so disorientated, don't you? Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Horrible. Right. Okay. Well, I shall do that. I'll. I'll, uh, I'll do. Thank, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. It was such a good job, Chris. I, I'm willing to buy you a beer at five past eight in Belgium. I'll hold you. <laughs> <laughs> five past eight. But yes, five past eight, the half price, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> with it being Belgium, it'll probably be eight percent proof, so one will be. Oh, anyway, it's been lovely meeting you. I'm glad it was. Thank you. 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 Thank you.